Kentucky basketball continues to finalize their 2024-25 schedule, and they've added an extremely difficult exhibition opponent to face before their season kicks off. You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Daw, and on today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be discussing Kentucky basketball's new exhibition opponent, as well as a 2026 four-star power forward that is just Perfect for a Mark Pope system. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. Want to remind everyone out there that we are free and available on all platforms. If you are watching on YouTube, I would really appreciate it if you subscribe to the show. And if you are listening on podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you subscribed there as well. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. Kentucky basketball has scheduled a 2024-25 exhibition game for their schedule just here in a couple of months. Super excited. The season is getting closer and closer. This exhibition game comes six days before the season opener against Wright State on November 4th. This game occurring on October 29th against the Minnesota State Mankato Mavericks. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever heard of that school? You may have not heard of them because they are a Division II squad. And you may say, oh, well, this is going to be just simply a tune-up. There's not really a whole lot to dive into here. It's going to be a competition for us to get to see Mark Pope's squad in full effect, kind of get to see what everybody is about. But I will let you know. Minnesota, Minnesota State, the Mavs last season were the Division II national champions. They finished the season 35 and 2, 20 and 2 in conference play. This was broken by MSU head coach Matt Margenthaler. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. It might be Margenthaler. And he confirmed the matchup earlier today that this will happen again on October 29th, Kentucky versus Minnesota State Mankato. Really excited about this matchup. According to uh, the Herald uh, the Herald Leader, Minnesota State Mankato had a 35-2 record, won the NCAA D2 National Championship last season. The team's top scorer and assist leader, Malik Willingham, and top rebounder and shot blocker, Dylan Peters, played their final seasons of college basketball last year. But the Mavs are expected to return some key players from their title run. If you go look, look at their statistics, they actually lose three of their top four scores. Their leading guy returning is Justin Egan's, who averaged 12.6 points per game last season while shooting 41.3% from beyond the arc. He had 86 three-pointers the season ago. That was second best on the team behind Malik Willingham. But this is a team that is, it fits the narrative that we've been talking about when looking at Kentucky's non-con slate. It is yet another team that likes to play with tempo, that likes to shoot threes, and has a very high-octane offense overall. If you go look at the way that the Mavs played a season ago, they averaged almost 85 points per game. Uh, They had a point margin or point differential of plus 15. They outscored their opponents by about 15, 14 points per contest. Really, really fun stuff here. They made 9.2 three-pointers per game while shooting 38.2% from beyond the arc. That would have been good for top 35 nationally in college basketball a season ago. For some context here, BYU made 11.1 three-pointers per game in 2023, and Kentucky made 9.9 per contest last season. So Kentucky last year really knew how to fill it up. Mark Pope, Even more so, bringing his style over to UK with some new players that can really shoot the lights out of the basketball. Their first game is going to be against a team that very similarly loves to shoot the lights out of the basketball. Overall, they shot 49.1% from the floor, which is also very, very good. Again, 38% from three, 74% from the charity stripe, and they averaged 38.7 rebounds per game. They had a positive rebound margin. They had a positive scoring margin. They had a positive... uh, Turnover margin, uh, 2.2 turnover margin per game as well. They averaged two more steals than their opponents. They averaged a clean block and a half more than their opponents. They 
really did know how to score in bunches. It's a shame that three of their top four scorers, who averaged 18.7, 14.5, and 10.8 respectively, are not going to be in this matchup. But I think the the sentiment is still the same. The way that this team is going to be run by Coach Matt Margin, uh, Mar- Morgan Thaler, I think it's going to be the same. This is a team that wants to get out, run, shoot threes, make threes, score a lot of points. This is a legitimate challenge. This is not some, oh, you're going to walk in with all of these insane athletes like Kentucky has done in the past, and they're just going to out-muscle uh, competition early on in the season to kind of get a feel for how they want to perform as a team. That's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing a much different style of program underneath Mark Pope face off against a similarly built style of program, at least offensively, in this D2 national title uh, winner here in in MSU uh, Mavericks. This is going to be fun. I think this is going to be very, very fun. Just based off of what we have seen, and what we have seen has been two highlight videos against La Familia that Kentucky has posted on Twitter. By the way, shout out to La Familia, who, who, who's just been looking really, really solid so far through the TBT. Head coach Tyler Eula is showing the world how to advance past the uh, the second round to get to the Sweet 16. It's not that difficult, Kentucky. Uh, apparently, apparently, Kentucky in uh, the La Familia form has figured out how to make that happen, but I digress. They've been super awesome, but Kentucky's only highlights that we have of this current team come against La Familia in posts that were on Twitter and Instagram, just about two-minute, one-and-a-half-minute highlight videos apiece. We broke that down on a recent episode on Locked On Kentucky. If you want to go check that out, just kind of what we saw from the scoring, what we saw from different players getting touches. Jackson Robinson was great. Amari Williams is a really good passer. Kirk Carissa can fill it up. There are a bunch of different places to go and look and see positivity. And Kentucky was without what is probably going to end up being their starting point guard and shooting guard. I would assume Kobe Brea starts with a two, but anyway, that's a conversation for another day. All of this to say, we don't have a ton to go off of when knowing what this team is individually. But what we do have is an offensive style that is clear and is aggressive and it is fun. Got to see it perfectly played out in those two highlight videos. Spacing, Three-pointers, tempo, transition, involving your bigs in a variety of ways that are not just down low rebounding and and defending. This is a very straightforward in their identity team. Kentucky knows what they have here. Going up against somebody like MSU, I think it's going to be not necessarily an athletic challenge, but it's definitely going to be a mental one. The way that Kentucky wants to play basketball and the way that the players have talked about it, they've said and they've proven, hey, if you want to keep up with us, if you want to play defense against us, you're going to have to be willing to run. And sometimes I ask the question, just sitting here thinking about the way this team is going to be comprised, hey, how willing is this Kentucky team When it comes to defense, running up and down the court to get stops, to make plays that are not scoring the basketball, it does not take a rocket scientist to figure out, more often than not, players like to play a little bit more offense than they do defense. That's just, I, I think that's almost, you could almost say that's human nature. It's more fun to try and go out and score than it is to try and prevent somebody from scoring. Naturally, with the way that this team operates, there's going to be more of an emphasis put on scoring the basketball. And I don't necessarily know if that's going to be just the way that Kentucky plays or if it's going to be a mental thing. If it's how Coach Pope uh, talks to them, it's definitely going to be how the media and the fans see it. They're going to look at this team, and the first thing that's going to come to their mind is scoring and running up and down the court. Can they translate that energy and desire to the defensive end of the floor enough to where you see a significantly improved product compared to what Coach Cal had last year. I hope so. My expectation is that it is better. But teams like this, MSU, they they post challenges. They post threats. This is legitimate. And it's not just them. Again, like I said, there are a number of teams up and down this non-con slate in the mid-major ranks that Kentucky has added 
that do exactly what MSU does. They play with tempo, and they pl- and they push you, and they try and knock down outside shots, and even if they don't take a ton, they knock them down at a very high rate. I think Western Kentucky is a great example of this. Somebody that's coming towards the tail end of Kentucky's non-con slate. But there are a bunch of Western Kentucky types within this early schedule. And it's going to be, I think, good conditioning for Kentucky on defense. And I also think it's going to kind of emphasize and encourage the fans to buy into what Pope is trying to do. Because if Kentucky is able to do the thing that they want to do, and then prevent similarly similarly built opponents from doing the same thing. They can have these wide victory margins, or they can just prove to be, through the eye test, significantly better than a lot of competition because of their experience and because of their system. It's going to get people really hyped up, and that's kind of what we're all about, is seeing Kentucky win, getting excited, and seeing what they could potentially do in the postseason. I love this scheduling. I'm really excited about it again, and it's a shame that they only bring back one of their top four scores. I would have loved to have seen this team even even halfway uh, in full effect to where they were a season ago playing against this Kentucky team. I think it would have been a challenge. I think it would have been fun. I, I cannot wait to see this unfold. Super excited. Again, October 29th is uh, when this game is happening. All right, I want to talk here for a little bit about a four-star power forward that Kentucky basketball has reached out to that has played really, really well at Peach Jam. I mean, really, really well at Peach Jam. Before we dive into that, though, I do want to tell you guys about our friends over at FanDuel. I really, really love sports, and I love them so much that I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games, and the sports just aren't sportsing like we want them to. But FanDuel lets us keep the sports going whenever we want, and all we have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime we could be in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right, there's something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. That is FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, continuing along here on the Monday edition of Locked On Kentucky. Lance Dahl hanging out here with you. So we've talked about why I think the Division II matchup in this exhibition game against Minnesota State, the Mavs, 35-2 and last year, why this is going to be so fun and so important for Kentucky. Let's dive into a prospect that has been performing very well at Peach Jam that Kentucky basketball just offered. Peach Jam... It's been super fun so far this season. Probably going to get you a recap here in the next few days, kind of breaking down what Kentucky saw as far as the assistants that were there and who they were watching and who was offered because there's a number of different players. In fact, there's another player in this year's class, 2026, that's actually the number one overall player that we're probably going to talk about on tomorrow's episode, just to give you guys a sneak peek on that. But 2026 four-star power forward, almost said uh, finish power forward because that's what He is. He's from Finland. I believe his name is pronounced Mika Murinen. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. M-I-I-K-K-A-M-U-U-R-I-N-E-N. Mika Murinen. I think that's how you pronounce his name. If I'm wrong, you are more than welcome to correct me. Murinen had a very, very good performance in the Nike EYBL Uh, 16 under championship on Sunday, just yesterday. 21 points, 8 of 11 shooting, 4 of 7 from beyond the arc. And you may say, well, maybe he's a little undersized for his power forward position and he's just a really good shooter. We have to understand the archetype, the type of player that Mark Pope likes to operate with. Tall, ranging from lanky to physical, wings forwards that can shoot the lights out of the ball. Mika is six foot 10, 190 pounds at power forward. Number 69 overall prospect nationally, number 14 player, in, or excuse me, number 14 power forward in the 2026 class, and number five player in the state of Arizona plays at Compass Prep in Chandler, Arizona. A lot of Kentucky Wildcats have come or played at Compass Prep. Murinen is the perfect 
I mean the perfect type of player that you're looking at when you think Mark Pope, you think three-point shooting, and you think modern basketball. What does the NBA prioritize more than anything? Versatility and height. They prioritize taller players, bigger players, who can do the things that typically smaller players were more effective at in the past. If you are able to implement this sort of versatility across your roster and play what is known as positionless basketball, you can be more effective in a lot of different areas because if you have tall guys that can do the things that small guys can do, taller almost every single time is going to be better as far as matchups and as far as just the ability to outscore your opponent and play better defense. Murinen, I think, is a perfect example of that. If you go and watch his game where he scored 21 points uh, in that EYBL circuit, you can also watch his, his highlights against Peach Jam. That literally just happened. It is exactly what you want to see in the NBA, and it's exactly what you want to see with Mark Pope in his offense. Transition, deep range. I'm talking deep range from Murinen. Really, really fun stuff. I mean, if you don't enjoy a fast break ending with a triple from a six foot ten, six foot eleven guy who takes one dribble and pops it after he gets uh, gets past half court, I don't know what to tell you. It's super fun basketball, and I think it opens up things offensively. If we're just talking about how would it fit with Mark Pope, it opens up things offensively if the kid can pass, which I think is something that he's going to have to work on just a little bit. But if he can end up passing the ball well, then all of a sudden you start to get to the rest of the aspects of the Mark Pope offense, playing in the half court, zoom offense, bringing your bigs like uh, Murinen out to the perimeter, getting guys to cut. If you watch those highlight videos that uh, Kentucky had versus La Familia, or if you I've been listening to the show, and you listen to us break it down. We broke down exactly kind of what Kentucky liked to do. If you are not able to get a shot from the perimeter and the opposing defense is putting a lot of emphasis on guarding that, get somebody to cut, put it, or throw it into the middle of the paint, and let somebody like Amari Williams go to work or let some guard or wing slashing or cutting uh, from outside the perimeter, let them get an easy bucket. Somebody like Mirinen would be super lethal especially if he is able to play with that sort of range from beyond the arc where you can essentially say, hey, we're going to back him up a couple of feet off the line, and if you want to come out and contest that, if we kick and get the ball in and kick it outside, you're more than welcome to do that. But we also have capable passers and about three other shooters on the court at the same time that can knock down the three ball just as, if not more effectively than he can. So it's kind of, at this point, Pick your poison, which I think may be the perfect way to describe Mark Pope and Kentucky basketball's offense this season because of how many really good catch-and-shoot players Kentucky has. It's essentially going to end up being pick your poison. If Murinen, who again just received a Kentucky offer, really wants to kind of dive into what Kentucky's about, I think what he will come to find is a lot of different things that would make him really excited to come and play here. It is the style of play that fits the way that he wants to to play on the court. It fits it better than almost any other team in the country. Now, I will say another team uh, in the country that plays similarly to the Kentucky Wildcats actually has already reached out to him. Uh, He, or excuse me, Kentucky has joined an offer sheet according to catspaws.com that also includes the like of, of Alabama, BYU, Cincinnati, Duke, Illinois, Michigan, Texas Tech, and UCLA. Alabama right there, it's uh, it's another team in your conference that loves to go out and shoot the three. This is going to be tough uh, to kind of get in this recruiting here if you don't start to make some moves early. Right now, uh, it's kind of it's going to be kind of tough to kind of get him to stay away from teams like Alabama, Duke, even BYU with their new coach Kevin Kevin Young. Those t- those programs are going to show him all of the different things that would kind of pull him away from a place like Kentucky as far as, hey, we got three-point shooting too. Hey, we've got culture too. Hey, we've got five-star prospects to surround you with as well. So Kentucky's got to get in on on this quick. And I think that they would be really, really, really good with a player or players like Murin. And we've talked about a few. Braylon Mullins uh, from the 2025 class, if I'm not mistaken, is another. He just announced his top 10 and Kentucky's in it along with teams like Alabama, Tennessee, Gonzaga, and a bunch of other really high-profile, offensively strong programs. 
Uh, final thing I want to note here about Murinen. Throughout the event, the Nike EYBL, if I'm not mistaken, 21.4 points per game, 61.8% shooting, making 14 of 28 shots from beyond the arc, leading Brad Beal elite to the title. Really, really, really good player here in Mika Murinen. All right, that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Dahl underscore, and you can follow the show over on Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave those in the YouTube comments below. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and God bless.